for children who are forced are more reliant on their mothers to facilitate their access to friends' houses, playgrounds, days out, etc. Some perpetrators deprived mothers and children of resources and even imprisoned them. And these extreme tactics for depriving the family of freedom, independence and resources impacted on children as well as mothers. Now we're going to hear from one mother and her 20-year-old son. They wanted to be interviewed together and they chipped in on each other's answers. He tell us that we couldn't touch the food in the fridge, that we weren't allowed to eat. He'd lock us in the house a lot of the time so we couldn't get out. He'd unplug the phone. He'd take the power out because in the hall we've got an old electric box where you can take things out and that's it, you've got no power. He used to take an element out the central heating so we'd have no heating. He'd lock us in the house and go out. He'd take the modem so John couldn't do his homework and I couldn't do my banking on the computer. So we were prisoners in a way. This highlights how some fathers were directly and purposefully extending their coercive controlling abuse over their children, as well as over their girlfriend or wife. Children were also affected by the constrained behavior that the perpetrator demanded from them. Many children reported that they could not say and do normal age appropriate things in their homes when the coercive controller was there. They had to constrain their own natural behavior as children to comply with their father's demands. When he came home from work, he'd want to spend time with them and they were always his girls. He used to say to Zoe, you're my little angel. But at the same time, they couldn't shout, they couldn't make noise, they couldn't be children around him unless it was on his terms. It was all right if he wanted to play with them, but at other times, it was like he wanted them to disappear. I would be sort of quiet. I didn't shout out or run around. Wouldn't it be great if mums leaving these dads was enough to make the children safe and end the coercive control? But so often it is not. Because coercive control perpetrators don't tend to respect their partner's decision to end the relationship. And they typically continue in their efforts to control and dominate their partner's life and or punish them for trying to break free. And this too has severe impacts on children. He used to bring some other men to the house and me and my brothers feared for our lives because he used to smack on the doors and I used to hide. So again, drawing on my research, this is what children and children themselves reported about their father's post-separation behavior. My dad's injunction ran out and he kept turning up at the house. Then he wrote something on the back door. He wrote, dead bitch. And my mum tried to get it removed before we could see it, but I saw it before it got removed. These terrifying actions from fathers could make children's and mothers' lives frightening and unpredictable. Fathers' actions drastically limited the safe space available to children and mothers, often leaving them under siege. And it was evident from the interviews that this frightening fathering undermined children's mental health and their well-being, their physical security and their education. Perpetrators would also use something that in my 2020 paper I term admirable fathering as part of their ongoing attempts to control ex-partners and children. They chose to present themselves as admirable fathers to school staff, other parents, wider communities, both online and offline, and professionals and courts. So whether this was on Facebook or at the school gates, they were putting on the persona of the admirable father. And this could include playing the role of being a caring father, a committed father, or a vulnerable victim father, or perhaps all three. But whatever it was, it was always a father deserving of praise and support. And this appeared to be part of the perpetrator's strategy to increase their own power while further marginalizing and weakening their ex-partner who then becomes thought of negatively in their community. Some perpetrators directed performances of admirable fathering at their children, for example, by claiming to be vulnerable victims. During our weekend visits to him, he'd say, your mum makes me cry, your mum makes me do this stuff, I can't see you because of your mum. And he paints such a bad picture of her. He blamed her and us for everything. 
He said he was on antidepressants because I wasn't seeing him often enough. I felt very small and bad. After our weekend visits with our father, my sister Zoe would be off school most Mondays because she felt so ill. She was on the sofa being held by mum and crying. He would call my sister Zoe and say, you're the only one who really loves me. I was just so drained and I felt like crying all the time. And it's worth noting here that these weekend visits were family court ordered and the what the perpetrator is doing here, which could be considered psychological abuse, probably wouldn't have been enough to get the family court to reconsider those visits because it's, the children weren't being beaten. But the impact it's having on the children, you can see, is so severe and they're missing school because of it and they're drained and they feel like crying all the time. They feel small, they feel bad. So it's really very significant. And here, what was actually going on was this father was producing guilt chips in his daughters, refusing to take responsibility for his own emotional state. By presenting himself as a vulnerable victim, he was coercing his daughters into maintaining relationships with him that were harmful to their well-being. By making his children feel as though they were responsible for his welfare, he was disguising the emotional power that he was actually wielding over them. Many children experienced their father as a constantly negative presence in their post-separation lives, whether they saw him frequently or not. Those children who did not see their father frequently were still aware that nothing was stopping him reappearing in their lives at any point in causing further harm. And this left the children in a continual state of anxiety and worry and harmed their ability to live normal lives. Children often feared that they might encounter their father and be harmed by him, and this could lead to panic attacks, bedwetting, and nightmares. Some children described monitoring their surroundings continuously as a protective strategy. I have to have it so I check that the doors are locked and the windows closed. Children also sought to increase their own and their mother's security by remaining with her. So here we have a 12-year-old boy, Bob, saying, now sometimes I'll sleep in my mum's bed because I feel more comfortable there and I feel more safe sleeping there. And obviously we wouldn't normally see 12 year old boys sleeping in their mum's beds, but sleeping by himself felt too scary, too uncomfortable, unsafe, because he knew his father was out there and could appear at any time to cause him harm. And as another child said, sometimes we weren't able to go to school. I didn't want to leave my mum alone for the day. And this child also elaborated, although I don't have the quote here, that that there was this constant worry about pets when they did go to school because they didn't know whether they would come home and find their pets alive or dead and they were very aware that dad could come into the home while they were gone and kill their pets so when they were sitting at school that was what was preoccupying their thoughts it's important before we finish to note that mothers being targeted by coercive controllers tend to do what they can do to keep their children as safe and okay as possible. And mothers were making huge efforts to try and keep their children as safe and okay as possible. But of course, their ability to do this can be limited by the father's determination to abuse in ways that harm the children. Even though mothers cannot stop the father's choices to use harmful behavior, Positive parenting for mothers is still a major factor in helping children to cope with the father's domestic abuse. If you ask children themselves, who is your most important source of support, who has helped you to cope with this, they're most likely to say, it was my mum. Mothers are cited by children who live with domestic abuse as their most important source of help more than anyone else in their lives. Their relationship with their mother is most children's major support in coping. So to conclude, coercive control is a severe form of abuse and perpetrators of coercive control cause high levels of harm and high costs. Coercive control perpetrating fathers tend to parent their children in negative ways and subject their children to coercive control in ways that profoundly harm the children's day-to-day -day experience of life. Mothers separating from fathers is unlikely to be enough to make the children safe as fathers tend to be determined to continue their coercive control post-separation. The problem lies with the perpetrator. Tackling the problem means tackling the perpetrator, holding them accountable, curbing their ability to continue abusing, 
and helping the adult and the child victims and survivors to be safe, really safe, not just safe on paper, not safe in theory, but so safe that you can actually ask them, how do you feel? And they say, we feel safe. And that's where we need to get to. So just to let you know, my book, Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives, is going to be published in August 2022. And if you buy it direct from the publisher, you can get 30% off. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Dr Emma Catt. Please feel free to email me and also follow me on Twitter where I'm very active. And finally, these are the references that I've drawn on today. I hope you found this a useful talk and that you have a good rest of the festival. So uh, thank you so much for coming back in. Uh, please take a seat. We'll be starting shortly. to get in my pocket, thank you. Right. Welcome back everyone. Hope you've had a good day so far. Just another reminder that after the plenary, you're all invited to a drinks reception and barbecue, which will be on B floor. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us then. Um, whilst uh, we're just waiting, um, please take time to vote for your best presentation if you haven't already done so. And we'll be having prizes at the last session. But I'd like to start off by introducing Yannette, who's kindly come over here uh, to help us with our theme of urban health. And thank you, Yannette. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Arpana. Um, I'm amazed that you got so much into this one day. Congratulations. And it does feel nice to be here in person. The last couple of years I was on Zoom. Um, seeing faces that I saw, but it's nice to see people in the flesh. So I'm just going to quickly talk um, following on today, following on on my colleague, Dr. Remy Shep King's presentation earlier this morning and the amazing presentations and the sessions that I was just in um, and this theme of, um, I, Pallavi, you'll remember this, this theme of um, governance, good governance, um, for, for health. And it's something that um, I've been working with the Think 20 on this notion of mutual vulnerabilities. So you've heard time and time again um, about the SDGs. You know it by heart by now because Manchester is famed for its interaction with the SDGs. So um, this is an important framework. All I'll say about this, um, these um, SDGs serve as action points for addressing the health of the urban poor um, for robust development of communities, municipalities, and cities. And my colleagues, um, Ramirez and Rubio in 2019, presented us with a really nice um, schematic diagram uh, of how they all come together. And at least 48 of the, of, of the total 169 targets are focused on urbanization and health. So I focus heavily on the global south 
um, uh, these days. And so uh, the, what is the global south urbanization scenario? Most of you are aware that um, for Africa and Asia, by 2050, nearly or more than 60% of the population of the continent, it keeps shifting. As a demographer, I look at these numbers and seeing this demographic transition occurring, um, significant numbers of people are expected to be living in urban or, and or peri-urban areas. A, a good percentage of them are children and adolescents. And we're also experiencing another demographic um, event that's called the youth bulge. So these, these two things are going on simultaneously as we're experiencing climate change. For Africa and Asia, the, the issue is significant, it's acute, it's critical, but it's, it's no less in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, where I'm from, um, over 80% of people already live in urban areas and the significant poverty and um, ensuing um, uh, concomitant issues that go along with that are very present. So what are some of these issues? Uh, I was really excited in the earlier session, each presenter, and we had about six, it was like a, a speed dating of research presenters. Each of these items were addressed in one form or another, environmental inequities, um, of course, rapidly expanding urban areas. A significant thing that kept coming up is this weak urban governance system. I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's important because we're looking at issues related to human capital, talking with economists who are collabor you're coll as an, uh, collaborating with. Um, the IMF is saying we need to talk with epidemiologists on this human capital issue. And of course, the standard issues of sanitation, education, employment, health services, all these links to the formal urban economy. The economics of urbanization is critical. We're talking about the the, um, the value, economic value of the health of women and girls. Um, economics is, is coming up um, rapid in, in every of our conversations these days, largely as a result of what we experienced with, we are experiencing with COVID. So, and others talked earlier about the growth of mid-sized cities, leading to the issues that we discussed in the session earlier, clean water issues, sanitation, housing is a critical issue and of course, accessibility to healthcare. Um, and it, the, the litany of, the list continues. I have a, 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 the following slide, same, lack of access to water and sanitation, malnutrition, um, inequitable ac access. We cannot ignore inequities. We, 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 it it is, is part and parcel of the issue. The persistence of communicable diseases. Um, we thought we were rounding the bend and COVID said, ah, not quite. Here we are dealing with, you heard earlier this morning, we're still dealing with, with aspects of polio that we thought that we, we could get ahead of. And of course, external causes of death and injury, traffic accidents, violence, is a, there's an uptick, um, drug and alcohol, substance use, and of course, gender-based violence. So as, as I mentioned, these demographic transitions, we've got the youth, youth bulge on a large segment of the global south, um, and in some of those places, we have the simultaneous issue of aging populations. So it's a demographic time bomb, um, as dem demographic demographers like to say. Um, and layered upon that is, an, is this whole issue of climate change. Um, we know well here in, in, in Europe about the ambient, the increased ambient temperatures. We just experienced that. There's flooding, Bangladesh, low-lying areas. Um, I, I was born in a country that um, is expected, the city is expected to be underwater by 2050. Um, and of course, storms, contaminants in storms and, and, and fires. We just had a significant fire in, 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 in London um, and that's happening. There's, there's fire burning in, in, in the US and California and Nevada. There's fire burning across the globe. Um, and this issue of migration, we, um, people are moving for betterment. A lot of it is forced, war, activities, a lot of it is unplanned, and of course, natural disasters. So I wanna spend a little time in these few moments looking at COVID-related re reverse migration because we, we saw something very interesting happen in India. Um, many of you might've heard of this um, reverse migration as a result of, of COVID, people, 
coup when 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 the cities, the large cities were shut down, the laborers headed back to their homes. What triggered this? It was um, the country announced a countrywide lockdown for 21 days in March of 2021, except for essential services, all services were stopped and people were asked to quarantine. So you have laborers, day wage people, how can they quarantine? They're living outdoors, they're, they're living domestics, there's no place to quarantine other than to head back to their home villages or hometowns. Well, no transportation. It was all shut down across the country. No rail, no air, all forms of transportation. And then on top of that, COVID was, was flaring up and the lockdown was extended. So we saw a mass exodus of people. Um, this sounds a little morbid, but as demographers, we were like, wow, this is really happening in our in, in our in real time, and we get to document this. Um, but this was a tragedy. This was this was desperation, um, and and we saw this in real time. So what happened as a result of that? The country witnessed an unprecedented exodus of migrant laborers and their families returning to their home villages. People actually walked significant distances. Many didn't reach. Many died along the way. Why they needed to do that? They had to. There was an absence of a regular income. There was uncertainty. What would happen next? There was fear of disease. Um, you know, so people did what they did. Survival caused them to do this. And in that process, we had we had some unrest. People were stranded, and some people died. So, I like maps. So I wanted to share a map with you. If you can see the path tracking here. Um, India is an amazing country, and that it's no reason it's uh, we, we know why it's called a subcontinent because it's large, diverse, and distinct. And you can see this literally happened across the region. People were even moving back to places like Uttarakhand that are mountainous. Um, so this was this was a significant event, um, a really important event in terms of demographic transitions. So what happened? Close to 3,000 people as that were reported. We, the, 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 the thinking is that there's much more died. Women and children were the most vulnerable and worst affected. Um, within two months of the lockdown, at least 17 million migrants, uh, migrants and women live in domestics, brick kiln, construction workers, et cetera, they lost their jobs. There was no livelihood, no resources, um, the bulk of migrants, of course, as their laborers were from lower socioeconomic status, and they were part of the informal sector. And of course, as usually the case, women accounted for half of, of those people, uh, migrants in Pakistan. So there was unrest. Um, people went without food. They walked and traveled long distances back to their home villages. Once they got there, however, they were not necessarily welcome. They faced isolation and forced change of occupation. All of a sudden, they were working in the city, sending money back, and now that dried up, so they, they had to figure something else. What do we do? Um, unemployment um, ensued, and women suffered exploitation, and it led to not just violence acro across the board, but gender-based violence. Women suffered disproportionately. Lots of reporting we heard of throughout this um, conference today, there were many presentations that discussed that. And naturally, there were no healthcare services, no adequate quarantine centers, no medical facilities that could respond to um, emergent issues. So this makes, comes to this notion, and we had a discussion about this in the last session, about this need for, and, and Dr. Shepting talked about it from the UN Habitat perspective, about this need for governance for health. There's, a, there's an international call to that. Um, not only UN Habitat's looking at that, the WHO, the Think 20 is looking at that very particularly, but particularly when we talk about the, refer to the global self. So what do we need to do? We as academics, we as policymakers, we as uh, practitioners, people, um, um, advocates and activists, we need to mobilize and engage. We need this cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary urban health leaders in research, policy, and practice. 
um, we need to we need to advance and 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 catalyze the evidence base re regarding determinants and and the programs that work and the policies critical for achieving healthy and sustainable urban environments. And again, I like this word catalyze keeps coming up, but we also need to improve cross sector collaborations to solve urban challenges. And it has to happen. Um, Dr. Shepting talked about the importance of context. It has to be local, global, global, local. It has to be contextual. It has to be regional and national and subnational. And um, for us in this room, um, it requires interdisciplinary collaboration among all of us as stakeholders, whether we, we're researchers and educators, implementers and practitioners, if we're municipal workers and municipal leaders, policymakers, both at the subnational, national, and regional levels, it can no longer be um, we over here looking at the problem there and articulating the need. It has to be community, national, subnational, regional, global. Um, and advocates of every level um, need to be activated. It's critical. We saw what happened with the re reverse migration issue. And so how do we do this? And um, my neuroscience colleague says, you, you have to think of three things because you know you'll get them done. So I always think of three things. We need innovative partnerships at every level. And what, what, does, what does that mean? Engagement of municipal and national leaders and implementers and the, and the private sector all working together. And private sector could mean NGOs, um, you know, um, entrepreneurial individuals all across the board. And support, supportive, adaptive, and sustainable program implementation. So supportive and adaptive sounds like great adjectives, but we all often have programs implemented and there's no reflection on, is this really sustainable? Is it really supporting the issue? Is it really getting at, at the issue? Are we engaging the people who we're attempting to um, impact? And what's their role in, in ensuring that these work? And that puts the, the notion of privatizing localized operational change. And so I just wanted to spend, I know you've been sitting long and I thought I'm gonna hit it, get in, fix it like a surgeon and get out. So I wanted to bring this um, to, to you as a, as a provocative to think and to engage. So thank you for that. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hello from Manchester. Uh, are you um, are you addressing me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I can hear you from Massachusetts, yes. It's lovely that you could join us. Um, we're just sorting out some technical issues, but um, 
we wanted to give you our health and well-being award and um, it's such a pleasure um, to hear you speak after seeing you on various um, TED talks and your podcasts as well so if um, we've hopefully sorted out the technical problems are you able to share your screen and start your presentation? Uh, I am indeed. I thank you for the, the award. It's a great honor. I have uh, massive and increasing respect for public health and its accomplishments, and so this is a tremendous honor. Thank you. Yes, and I'm I am uh, ready to begin. If you're all, if you're ready to hear me, yes, yes. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to discuss a topic that we have all come to realize is uh, surprisingly relevant to public health, and that is human rationality. I'll be speaking about my uh, recent book, Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters. Now, rationality presents us with a puzzle, and I probably don't have to remind the people in this room of what that puzzle is. Uh, on the one hand, we are an astonishingly rational species in terms of our collective scientific and technological accomplishments. We have walked on the moon and photographed our home planet. We have plumbed the uh, distant galaxies and the origin of the universe. We have uncovered the secret of life. Uh, we have discovered much about how our own minds work. And we have fought back against the scourges that have immiserated our species with our existence, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, including uh, war, famine, poverty, uh, child mortality. And again, the people in this room are uh, well aware of the contributions of public health to increasing longevity and decreasing mortality. At the same time, a majority of Americans between 18 and 24 think that astrology is very or sort of scientific. Large proportions believe in conspiracy theories, such as that the COVID-19 vaccine was a plot to implant uh, microchips in people's bodies financed by Bill Gates and George Soros. That the American deep state houses a cabal of Satan-worshipping cannibalistic pedophiles. <clears throat> Many people uh, enjoy fake news, such as Obama signs executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide, or Yoko Ono, I had an affair with Hillary Clinton in the 1970s. And large proportions believe in paranormal woo-woo, such as possession by the devil, extrasensory perception, ghosts and spirits, witches, and spiritual energy in mountains, trees, and crystals. How do we resolve this, that paradox? That is what I attempt to do in rationality. Uh, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters, beginning with what it is. What is rationality? I define it as the use of knowledge to attain goals. And my favorite characterization of a, that, that spells out this definition comes from one of my intellectual heroes, William James, the namesake of the building that I work, at in, uh, work, work in at Harvard. We try to put his finger on the difference between a uh, physical uh, entity that we would be willing to credit with rationality and a uh, superficially similar entity that seems to be the same thing, but which we would not credit with rationality. And here's the way William James uh, can uh, specify the difference. Romeo wants Juliet as the filings want the magnet. And if no obstacles intervene, he moves toward her by as straight a line as they. But Romeo and Juliet, if a wall be built between them, do not remain idiotically presenting their, pressing their faces against the opposite sides of the magnet and filings of the car. Romeo soon finds a circuitous way by scaling the wall or otherwise of touching Juliet's lips directly. With the filings, the path is fixed. Whether it reaches the end depends on accidents. With the lever, it is the end which is fixed. The path may be modified indefinitely. That's rationality. It raises the question, how can knowledge be used to attain goals? And that brings us to the 
uh, topic often called in this area normative models. That is models from mathematics or logic or artificial intelligence on how a uh, rational agent ought to behave in order to uh, uh, attain goals. Uh, let me, uh, a good part of the book, and, and uh, I will quickly review them here, consists of a set of normative models that I think should be in the mental toolkit of every educated person, should be a focus of our education. They not only help us reason better, but they help us to avoid common fallacies that the unaided human mind is vulnerable to. Uh, for example, uh, we'll begin with logic, the most basic of all, which uh, helps us attain the goal of, of deriving new true propositions from existing ones, and help us avoid, avoid fallacies like affirming the consequent, as in every creative genius was laughed at in his time, people laugh at my ideas, therefore I am a creative genius. Probability. The likelihood of an event depends on the number of occurrences as a proportion of the number of opportunities. Understanding this normative model can help us avoid fallacies like the availability bias, documented by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, in which the subjective likelihood of an event depends on how easily you can recall anecdotes and images. Illustrated in this SNBC cartoon, they caption as this is why people should learn statistics, I will not fly in a plane. They aren't safe from terrorists. Hold on, I'll text you an article about it. Bayes' rule. We should give credence to a hypothesis to the extent that it's credible a priori, it's consistent with the evidence, and the evidence is uncommon across the board. That is a verbal summary of the simple algebraic formula that we call Bayes' theorem or Bayes' rule. This helps us avoid fallacies like base rate neglect, also identified by the psychologists Kahneman and Tursky. Uh, example, your child has a nervous twitch, so she probably has Tourette syndrome, terrifying a uh, mother uh, until she realizes that there are lots of um, children with nervous twitches, whereas Tourette syndrome is rather rare in the population. The theory of rational choice or expected utility. A rational actor chooses the option with the greatest expected utility, that is the sum of the probabilities times the payoffs. And that helps us avoid fallacies like buying extended warranties, which uh, a, uh, a large proportion of consumers do, uh, often costing a quarter or a third of the price of the product. Does it really make uh, sense to take out a health insurance policy on your toaster? Not if you intuitively calculated the expected utility. And perhaps uh, more consequentially, uh, does the expected utility of reading a text or an email a few minutes early make up for the probability of uh, the cost of losing your life times the probability of being in a fatal car crash caused by distracted driving? Going through that mental calculation could uh, save lives. The theory of signal detection, also called statistical decisions or uh, error management, a fallible observer cannot know whether an observation is real, namely a signal, or bogus, namely noise. He must set a decision cutoff that trades off misses and false alarms according to their costs. This helps us avoid fallacies like, we should deal with misconduct by making it easier to convict the accused. That will indeed result in more uh, guilty people being punished. It will also result in more innocent people being punished unless your sensitivity to the difference between uh, guilty and innocent is also increased, which is a different process. The th mathematical theory of games, how to make rational choices when the payoffs depend on someone else's rational choices, helping us avoid fallacies like we can avoid climate change if we just convince everyone that it's in their interest to conserve because no one wants to live on an a hotter planet. The problem is that it is in fact not in any individual's interest to conserve because their sacrifice will not avert global warming, warming while they will uh, pay the uh, immediate costs of uh, uh, standing at a uh, rainy bus stop while other people drive or enjoying a uh, warmth in winter or uh, cool temperatures uh, in, in uh, summer 
only if everyone simultaneously decides to conserve will anyone uh, benefit. Finally, there's a theory of causal inference to distinguish again that the, I need to remind you of the intense interest to the people at this meeting, to distinguish causation from correlation, one must manipulate the putative cause holding all else constant. Helping us avoid fallacies like failing to rule out compounds. And my favorite instance of this comes from an old Jewish joke in which a sexually frustrated couple approaches a rabbi for advice, it being the responsibility of the husband, according to a Talmudic law, to um, bring pleasure, sexual pleasure to his wife. Well, the rabbi strokes his beard and he says, well, here's something that you can do. Why don't you hire a handsome, young, strapping, uh, athletic man to wave a towel over you the next time you make love, and the, the, the fallacies will, will help the, the missus to achieve satisfaction. Well, they, they try that, they hire the man, and nothing happens. The, the, the earth doesn't move. They go back to the rabbi. The rabbi strokes his beard and uh, again and says, this time let's try a variation. Why don't we have the young man make love to uh, the wife, and you, the husband, wave the towel. Well, they try that, and sure enough, the, uh, the woman achieves a uh, ecstatic, screaming orgasm. The, man, the uh, husband says to the young man, schmuck, now that's how you wave a towel. Now, if you get that joke, you understand the difference between uh, correlation and causation and the problem of failing, failure to move out confounds. Well, this now raises the question, do people, you and me, uh, members of Homo sapiens follow normative models of rationality. And the uh, a first glance at the literature from cognitive psychology and behavioral economics suggests not so much. Let me give you two classic examples from uh, psychology research replicated many times over many decades. Here's an example from logic, the first normative model I introduced. Imagine a deck of cards where every card has a number on one side and a letter on the other. Here's a, a possible rule. If a card has a D on one side, it has a three on the other. Now, what, which cards do you have to turn over among these four to test whether the rule is satisfied or not? We've got a D, we've got a three, an F, sorry. We've got a three and we've got a seven. Why don't you ponder that for a second? Every card has a number on one side, a letter on the other. If there's a D on one side, there's a three on the other, which cards do you have to turn over? Okay, you think about that for yourself. Well, the experiment has been done literally hundreds of times. And the um, common answer is either D or D and three. The correct answer is D and seven. Why D and seven? Well, let's just think, think it through. Uh, you have to turn over the D card, and everyone knows that. Because if it does not have a three on the other, then the rule is falsified. You don't have to turn over the F card, because the rule says nothing about Fs. You uh, actually don't have to turn over the three card, though many people think you do, because the rule says if D, then three, not if three, then D. Thinking that you have to call, turn over the three card is succumbing to the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent. And you do have to turn over the seven card because if you did and there wasn't a D on the other side, then that would falsify the rule. If D then three, you've got a card with a D on one side, a seven on the other, then the, uh, the rule can't be true. In fact, most people uh, don't realize that you have to turn over the seven. A common explanation is this is due to confirmation bias. Namely, people see evidence that confirms their hypotheses not evidence that would falsify them. Here's another classic example. Uh, this one is from uh, involves Bayesian inference. It's sometimes called a medical decision-making problem. The probability that a woman has breast cancer is 1%. If a woman does have breast cancer, the probability that she tests positive is 90%. That's the sensitivity of the test. If a woman does not have breast cancer, the probability that she nevertheless tests positive is 9%. That's the false positive rate. But when we test positive, what is the chance that she actually has the disease? Again, this has been done many, many times. The most popular answer, even among physicians, is between 80 and 90%. The correct answer, according to Bayes' rule, is 9%. The reason is that if the base rate of the disease is only 1% to begin with, 
then most of the positives are probably going to be false positives. Uh, the uh, common explanation I alluded to briefly earlier is base rate neglect. The people tend to ignore the priors, the base rate in the population, the prior probability before you've even looked at the evidence, and they base their judgments on representative stereotypes, like someone's got a disease, they test positive. Well, what do these fallacies show? A common conclusion is the one that uh, was uh, famously articulated by Mr. Spock, Namely, humans are irrational. It's almost become something of a conventional wisdom as the result of this body of research in, by now well known in cognitive psychology and behavioral economics. But not so fast. Here's a twist on the logic problem. If a bar patron is drinking beer, he must be over 21. He implies Q, a simple conditional. You're a bouncer in a bar and you have to enforce the rule. Which of the following do you have to check? There's a guy drinking beer. Do you have to card him to find out how old he is? There's a guy drinking Coke. Do you have to card him to find out how old he is? There's a guy who's clearly over 21. Do you have to peer into his cup to see what he's drinking? There's a guy who's clearly under 21. Do you have to peer into his cup to see what he's drinking? Well, the correct answer is you've got to card the guy drinking beer. You've got to check the beverage of the young teenager. And everyone knows that. However, this is logically isomorphic to the card selection task if D and three. But this time, you just change the word again, everyone gets it right. Sometimes called the content effect, namely people are indeed illogical in problems couched in abstract symbols, but they can be perfectly logical when the abstract symbols are replaced with certain kinds of meaningful content, in particular obligations. Uh, if you uh, take a benefit, you must meet a requirement or pay a cost. And precautions. If you um, uh, take a precaution, you will be um, safer. Here's a twist on the probability problem, the medical decision making problem. 10 in every thousand women have breast cancer. Of these 10 women, nine will test positive. Of the 990 women without breast cancer, about 89 will test positive. A woman tests positive, what is the chance that she actually has breast cancer? Well, all I've done is I've changed the wording, the way that the numbers are framed. The problem is identical. Uh, now people can think to themselves, well, gee, there are 98 in all who test positive. Nine of those have cancer. Nine out of 98, you know, about 99%. 87% of doctors now get it correct. And even a majority of 10-year-olds get it right when the problem is framed in this way. What do I mean by this way? Well, there's a difference between expressing probabilistic information in terms of natural frequencies, namely a bunch of imaginable individuals and a proportion of them, as opposed to single event probabilities, namely a number between zero and one assigned to a single woman and indeed, or a single person. Uh, indeed, the, uh, even the concept, what is the probability that uh, Jane Doe has uh, breast cancer it's a little mysterious. Either she has cancer or she doesn't. What does probability have to do with it when you're talking about one individual? And indeed, that puzzle refers to everyday people as well. So a better conclusion about human rationality, I argue, is that people use ecological rationality, not in the sense of going green or, 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 or hugging a tree or avoiding plastic straws, but in the sense of a typical or natural human information environment. That is, people can reason about content relevant to their lives, uh, commingled with their subject matter knowledge, and they can estimate probabilities as they encounter sequences of events in their lives. What people have more trouble with is formal rationality. That is, they haven't mastered the abstract rules and formulas that can apply to any content, familiar or unfamiliar, concrete or abstract. These have to be learned and consciously deployed. Now, these are tremendously powerful. They explain how our species has been able to accomplish so much, but general purpose formulas in which you can plug in any variable, that's what is unintuitive to people. Okay, the question that I suspect you've all been waiting for, I know this having taught a course, having uh, given lectures, having written a book, is uh, the following, especially in the last few years. If people can be rational, why does humanity seem to be losing its mind? 
is not a simple question, and I think the, the answer comes in at least four parts. The first is a highly robust phenomenon in the psychology of judgment and decision-making known as motivated reasoning. I mentioned that rationality, by definition, is in service of a goal. Now, that goal is not necessarily objective truth. It can also be to win an argument in which the stakes matter to you. As uh, Upton Sinclair said, it, it is hard to convince a man of uh, something when his livelihood uh, depends on not understanding it. To show how wise and moral your group is, your religion, your tribe, your political sect, and how stupid and evil the opposing one is, sometimes called the my side bias, and it may be the most uh, robust and powerful of the hundreds of biases that have been documented by psychologists in behavioral economics. It is uncorrelated with intelligence. It is found in every demographic. Uh, likewise, to gain status and avoid ostracism as a hero uh, as a, rather than a traitor for your own side. Let me give you an example of the my side bias in action. Is this syllogism valid? Once again, I'm going to give you a simple uh, P implies Q or a P and Q problem. If college admissions are fair, then affirmative action laws are no longer necessary. That's a I'm sure you're aware of the uh, American bureaucratic jargon for policies that um, um, put a thumb on a scale for underrepresented groups such as women and racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, college admissions are not fair. Therefore, affirmative action laws are necessary. Now, is, uh, the question is, is this syllogism valid in the sense that does the conclusion follow logically from a premises? The answer is no. It's another example. This is an example of denying the antecedent complementary fallacy to affirming the consequent. And in uh, surveys, a majority of liberals, people on the left, commit the fallacy, and a majority of conservatives get it right. Now, if you ask a conservative, what is the explanation for this phenomenon? They'll say, well, it's what we told you all along. Liberals are irrational. Not so fast. Here's another syllogism. If less of your punishments deter people from committing crime, then capital punishment should not be used. Again, forgive the American example where capital punishment is still a thing in our country. Less of your punishments do not deter people from committing crime, therefore capital punishment should be used. Is that syllogism valid? Does the conclusion follow from the premises? The answer is no. Once again, it's an example of denying the antecedent the logical fallacy. Well, this time conservatives commit the fallacy, liberals don't. And of course, the common denominator is that everyone will uh, ratify a line of reasoning that leads to a conclusion that they believed in the first place uh, and will commit logical fallacies uh, in the process of doing so. A second part of the explanation is basic intuitions. This is a uh, discovery from cognitive psychology that all of us uh, are have certain ways of thinking, intuitive ways of understanding the world, part of our folk belief, our folk science, um, that are um, that help us just make sense of our day-to-day -day lives. One of them is dualism, uh, some back or theory of mind. Namely, we all sense that other people are not just hunks of flesh, but that they also have a mind. We don't treat other people as as robots or, or wind-up dolls or meat puppets, but we assume that like us, they have an inner life. They have thoughts and feelings, even though we can't experience them directly. Well, from there, it's a short step to imagine that there can be minds without bodies. And so you have belief in spirits, souls, ghosts, and afterlife, reincarnation, and ESP. The second basic intuition, then a highly relevant to public health, it is essentialism, namely that living things contain some kinds of, of invisible essence or stuff or power or energy that gives them their forms and powers. Well, from here, it's a short step to believe that disease is caused by an adulteration of one's essence by some kind of foreign contaminant. And so you have resistance to vaccines, which after all, when, you, when, you, when we, uh, when you think about them, consists of actually injecting a germ, a disease agent, into your bloodstream, into your flesh. Not surprising that it is highly counterintuitive that this would be a good thing to do. And of course, resistance to vaccines 
uh, as, as you all know, is as old as vaccines. And genetically modified organisms repeatedly proven to be uh, completely safe, uh, which uh, many uh, people and many bureaucrats in the uh, government organizations in the European Union uh, ban or, or label because of some general sense that they are uh, unnatural, artificial, therefore must be harmful. Conversely, people are receptive to uh, homeopathy and herbal remedies who seem to transfer some helpful essence into the body. And they're open to quack cures like purging, bloodletting, fasting, and the general idea of getting rid of toxins, which can be found in culture after culture. It's not just the medievals that matter, even the early moderns that practice bloodletting, but it has been independently um, invented by many cultures as a uh, cure for disease. A third basic intuition is teleology. We all know that our plans and artifacts are designed with purpose. Think about um, Romeo scaling the wall. Uh, so there's a short step to assume that the world is designed with purpose. And so you have a belief in beliefs in creationism, astrology, and synchronicity, in the vague sense that everything happens for a reason. Hoping this is happening for a reason. <laughs> Not sure exactly what that reason is now. <laughs> Less scientifically literate than believers. People who have what we would think all agree are the uh, scientifically validated beliefs vaccines are safe and effective, anthropogenic climate change is real. Uh, humans evolved by natural selection, yet their scientific understanding is uh, a millimeter deep at, at best. People who do believe in, in man-made climate change will say, oh, it doesn't have something to do with uh, the, the ozone hole or toxic waste dumps, plastic straws in the ocean. Uh, and often it's the deniers who are well-briefed litigators who uh, have absorbed the science uh, intimidatingly uh, well. The only difference is, Political ideology, the farther you are to the left, the more you accept climate change and evolution. The weird beliefs persist in people who don't trust the establishment, who think that scientists and government uh, agents and public health experts are just uh, another uh, priesthood, another partisan uh, um, uh, ideological group. A final part of the puzzle is uh, a distinction that I draw between realist beliefs and mythological beliefs. So why do people believe outlandish fake news and conspiracy theories? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by belief. Uh, people, uh, I suspect, and other, and other psychologists suggest, really hold two kinds of beliefs. On the one hand, there are beliefs in what I call the reality so. These are the physical objects around them, the other people they deal with face to face, the memory of their interactions. Beliefs in this zone are testable and people hold them if they're true. They have to be, that's how you make it through the day, how you keep petrol in the car and the kids and food in the fridge and the kids fed and clothed and off to school uh, on time. Reality is unforgiving and only if you deal with it uh, with logic and a correct understanding of cause and effect can you make it through the day. Then there's the mythology zone, as I call it. The distant past, the unknowable future, faraway peoples and places, remote corridors of power, what really happens in, in Downing Street or the White House or, or corporate boardrooms, the microscopic, the cosmic, counterfactual, metaphysical. Here, people hold beliefs because they're entertaining, they're uplifting, they're empowering, they're morally edifying. So after all, they generally don't make any difference in your life. Uh, whether they're true or false is, to most people, kind of irrelevant. Examples are religion, which uh, where the beliefs are, by admission, held by faith, not by reason. National myths, historical fiction, and I suspect fake news and conspiracy theories. So just to give you an example, uh, take Pizzagate, a predecessor of QAnon. This is the belief that uh, originated in the thought that Hillary Clinton 
ran a child sex ring out of the basement of a Washington area pizzeria, comic ping pong pizzeria. Well, how do people who believe in this theory act on it? Well, one of them, for example, left a one star review on uh, Google saying, the uh, pizza dough was incredibly underbaked and some suspicious men were giving funny looks to my five-year-old son. Now, this is not the kind of response that you would have if you actually thought that children were being raped in the basement. If you really believe that, you'd presumably call the police. It calls into question what belief in Pizzagate uh, really means. What does it mean to say, I believe that Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring? Well, what it really means is, I believe Hillary Clinton is so depraved that she's capable of doing such a thing. Or perhaps a more accurate paraphrase would be, Hillary, boo. Now, uh, that is, beliefs can be expressions of moral convictions, not a uh, fact and evidence-based commitment to the actual state of the world. Now, to many of us educated people, this is almost incomprehensible. Um, Bertrand Russell once uh, said, it is undesirable to believe a proposition when there is no ground whatsoever for supposing it is true. Now, if that strikes you as an obvious, boring, banal proposition, you are in a, probably a tiny minority of humanity, a child of the uh, scientific enlightenment. Uh, for most people, there are many propositions where there are no grounds for believing it is true, and belief is a matter of commitment to a uh, moral cause or uh, coalition. Uh, how can we become more rational? <clears throat> well, um, one thing that the tools of formal rationality, the normative models that I went to, should become second nature to educated people. Rationality should be the fourth R in schools together with reading, writing, and arithmetic. But it's not enough just to teach things in school. Again, I suspect that all of you know that um, many students forget material in a course. Um, as soon as they, the ink on the exam is dry, they close and then sell their textbooks. But the norms of rationality should be promoted in everyday discourse, in our op-eds, in our uh, conversations. <clears throat> An awareness of common cognitive fallacies like the availability bias, the my side bias, and arguing ad hominem should be promoted. It should be second nature. Uh, a, a, a humorous version of this comes from the American satirical uh, magazine called The Onion, which had the headline, CDC announces plan to send every U.S. household pamphlet on probabilistic thinking. Uh, again, something that I imagine is well appreciated in the community of public health. Um, but also, um, belief, basing beliefs on evidence, changing one's mind when the evidence changes, should be seen as signs of strength, not weakness. This is a kind of moral norm that can't be dictated from the top down, but it has got to just infiltrate the culture of, uh, of thoughtful people. Perhaps most important, institutions with their rationality promoting rules must be safeguarded. <clears throat> Um, in an, a truth promoting institution, one person can notice and make up for another person's uh, biases, and these institutions can make us collectively more rational than any of us is individually. Because after all, we're not angels, none of us. And in fact, for people to think I'm rational, everyone else is irrational, that's another cognitive bias, because everyone thinks that they're rational and everyone else is irrational, they can't all be right. We need rules of the game uh, that apply to everyone within a kind of uh, forum or ballpark uh, so that one person's delusions of being the only rational person can be counteracted by others. Again, I'm gonna go back to the a simple defend problem. Remember the card selection task? If, he, if, if there's a D on one side, there's a three on the other. As I mentioned, uh, performance on this task is not a pretty sight. When people work alone, about one in 10 get it right. But when people work in groups, they, they hash it over. Now, seven out of 10 get it right. All it takes is for one person to spot the correct answer, and they can almost always convince the others in the group uh, of, of the uh, logical answer. What do I mean by rationality promoting institutions? Well science with its demand for empirical testing and peer review, democratic government with its checks and balances, 
journalism with its demand for editing and fact checking, the judicial system with its adversarial proceedings, and in theory, academia with its commitment to freedom of inquiry and open debate, um, recently and worryingly challenged. Uh, even Wikipedia among digital media uh, is surprisingly accurate in independent audits and assays. Uh, Wikipedia, of course, operates with a explicit commitment to neutrality and objectivity. You gotta sign on to that to be a Wikipedia. You can compare that with uh, social media like Twitter and Facebook, which needless to say are not so accurate. What it means is that the credibility and objectivity of rationality promoting institutions like universities, like newspapers, like government agencies, like public health agencies must be safeguarded. Experts should be prepared to show their work, not just to issue edicts as if they were just another priesthood competing with, uh, with uh, rival priesthoods, but to explain why they are recommending what they are recommending. Fallibility should be acknowledged. The fact that uh, in, since all of us start out with a, from a position of ignorance, the fact that someone, some expert says something that is wrong should not be taken to discredit expertise, but rather that is part and parcel of the process of acquiring knowledge. Namely, you make falsifiable hypotheses and inevitably some of them will shown, be shown to be wrong. But we must all emphasize that it's the process of open inquiry, uh, broaching hypotheses, uh, having them evaluated, that is the only roadmap to uh, truth. Gratuitous politicization should be avoided. Again, this has relevance to public health. If public health agencies are seen to brand themselves as a um, uh, house organs or subsidiaries of the political left, they should not be surprised that the political right writes them off. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough. I have a uh, section in the book and a section in the talk on why rationality matters above and beyond all the ways that it matters that I've talked about so far. But uh, in a nutshell, I suggest that movements for social change, such as the abolition of war, oppression of uh, women and gay people and racial minorities, slavery, cruel punishments, have all been driven by uh, rational arguments that inspired the activists of the time. But I think I've gone on long enough in, in this forum, and so I will uh, stop now. And if there are any questions, I'd be uh, happy to entertain them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, that talk, and we've learned again so much. Um, we really wanted to hear you talk, so we've actually run out of time for questions, but would you be happy if we emailed them to you? Yes, of course. Thank you so much again. Thanks for having me, and thank you for the honour. So, uh, I'd like to introduce another friend of the festival and uh, delivering the Aidan Halligan Memorial Lecture. I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Can you hear me all right? No? How about that? Is that better? Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, if, if, what a two amazing presentations. I'm just thinking it's the very last bit of the day. Do you just want to, if, if our partner would allow us, we just stand up for five seconds and just stretch our arms and legs and then I'll, I'll get going. But don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Right, that's a, an amazing day. Um, and uh, can I just say, uh, First of all, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to our partner, Greg, and the team uh, for inviting me doing this uh, inaugural, um, sorry, this memorial lecture. Uh, it's a real honor, and it continues a tradition that's been going on annually in the festival. So it's, it's, it's really pleasing to, to continue that. Um, and also, I just want to thank our partner and, and the team here, um, because over the years, I was uh, North of England director for uh, Public Health England and the NHS and various other directors before, and I've always valued um, 
the work of you and your team, this festival, and all the other bits of work that you do. So, so thanks very, very much for that. And um, also, just to say, it's a real privilege to continue our collaboration as an honorary uh, chair here as well. So thank you. Um, I want to say a few things about uh, Aidan Halligan. Uh, and um, uh, some of you will have heard of Aidan before, particularly if you've been at these, um, these annual events. Um, and I also, uh, I'm going to just... I'm going to also just reflect on some personal areas of interest of mine, drawing on um, Aidan's uh, very inspirational work. Um, Aidan um, has had numerous obituaries and reflections on his amazing life, and many have spoken to him before, as I've said at this festival before, including Ian Jacobs, who was um, the vice president of the university and faculty uh, dean. And... Um, the website at the bottom of that picture um, uh, is of, from Ian, and I would encourage you to read it if you want uh, to hear more about Aidan. What I thought I would do, though, is just reflect on um, personal, my personal work with Aidan in the last 18 months uh, of his life when he worked with us in the north of England. Aidan was the deputy chief medical officer in the, two, in the, in the 2000s, and he was the youngest person to secure that post and before that, he was the first NHS director of clinical governance with responsibility for patient safety and quality of care across the NHS in England. But for those of us that knew him, he was one of the most charismatic communicators that I'd come across, passionately dedicated to public service and particularly for the most disadvantaged. And he thought nothing to challenge the status quo. It was Aidan's exceptional leadership for a project to address poor health in the north of England in the last 18 months of his life that meant so much to us at the university and across the north of England. The project was called Well North, and I see upstairs there is a flyer on Well North. And it was his idea, it was Aidan's idea. He won it came out of his frustration that the NHS particularly uh, was disconnected to the needs of uh, many people, particularly in disadvantaged and left behind communities, he was particularly concerned as the plight of the homeless, and that resulted from when he was working at um, University College London, and a, um, a, a person who was homeless was rejected from the A&E unit for being a nuisance, and then was found dead around the corner afterwards. And he was very, very passionately concerned about the plight of the help of the homeless. He wanted to turn services on their head to re reorientate them to improve the health of the poorest, fastest. Um, and uh, he felt that local communities and marginalised individuals needed to be empowered to challenge those traditional approaches to how services are run. So Aidan subsequently connected with communities and council leaders across the north of England. And out of that came uh, an agreement to run nine pathfinder areas. These are innovation zones in the most poorest of the areas across the north. And with an aim to allow the communities to take control and shape services around their needs. So I was involved, I not only knew Aidan before that, but I was involved because Public Health England uh, funded this along with local authorities in partnership. Um, but crucially, it was driven uh, locally by, uh, and led locally. Aidan engaged with the university also in partnership with others to evaluate the programme and to ensure that lessons are learned and shared. So it was a great privilege for me I've been the PHE sponsored director uh, for Well North, and I really enjoyed working at that time with Aidan in the very short time we collaborated. It wasn't so much what he said and what he did, it was more about how you felt about him and the mission, and I took a lot from that. So his sudden departure was a huge shock to many. But I'm pleased his legacy lived on, but it wasn't straightforward at the time. Aidan died in 2015, and we had to rapidly appraise the future of Well North at the time, 
with the pathfinders and council, uh, which was starting out at an early stage. In many ways, it was the most difficult of times because, uh, like many public services, were undergoing quite severe cuts, both locally uh, and, uh, and centrally, nationally, with Public Health England. But we didn't want to stall its work, uh, particularly on tackling poor health, health inequalities, and social inequalities, nor did we want to backtrack on the promises that were already made. So at the time, Duncan Selby, who was uh, PHE's chief executive and a close friend of Aidan's, and I, with others, engaged uh, Lord Andrew Mo Moson, who was a well-known social entrepreneur uh, from uh, London's East End, and particularly the Bromley by Bow project, which is um, very well known, to see what could be done. And Lord uh, Mosen accepted the challenge and continued to lead Well North. And a few of us here joined his board uh, and his new team and helped develop the nascent local um, pathfinder communities in uh, developing innovative approaches along very much in the spirit of Aidan's uh, vision. That also developed into Well North Enterprises because Lord Mosen was keen to work with local businesses and social uh, entrepreneurs. And that gave another uh, interesting dynamic to the learning process of working with the nine uh, pathfinders. And the university continues to, to evaluate that work with a partners team uh, here. If you want to, oops, did it wrong? If you want to learn more about Well North, uh, uh, enterprises, um, I do have a look at that website. Um, it's, it's very, very interesting indeed. So they're my reflections. I wanted just to uh, make a few comments about um, um, the north of England and why this sort of work we really need to scale up and quite urgently as well. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to uh, put a graph up in a minute which demonstrates life expectancy across the English regions over, over time. Life expectancy from birth, it's a curious measure of health um, because it measures when people on average, uh, or when communities or regions, what the average age of death is. So measuring health by death is a rather curious way of measuring health, but it is an internationally accepted uh, a norm uh, and, uh, and benchmark, so it's quite useful to see. However, before putting this slide up, I just want to tell you that as the north of England, having worked in the north of England for over 20 years as a DPH, as a director, and then across the north of England as a director, I thought I would never see what, I'm, what uh, I saw in this graph, what you see in this graph. So just to explain it, uh, this is, um, each of the colored lines are for English regions. Um, if I just stick to the left-hand side, males, um, it shows for each region since 2015 uh, when the average age of death for that population in that region was. And you can see it ranges from just under 81 to about 78. What that shows is, particularly if you look at the early years, is there is a distribution, a geographic inequality between um, the bottom three, which are the three regions of the north, that's here in the northwest, Yorkshire and Humber and northeast, compared to the rest of the country. There have been times where we've seen that gap close, but unfortunately since uh, the 2010s, we have seen no change in that gap, and in fact, if anything, the gap has got worse. But look at the final year, the impact of the pandemic. It's not just about deaths, but it's about the consequence of the pandemic, some of which, a lot of which were talked about this morning with um, Kevin Fenton and uh, Joe Beaufort from New York City. The, um, the causes and actions needed are multifactorial, as, uh, as mentioned, as discussed this morning. And this is not really the time to go over that. I'm sure many of you are aware. But it really comes down to like three sectors of intervention. First is the public sector, which includes national government. So how we tax, how we run our fiscal affairs, 
the environment, policies on environment, housing, education, health in all policies. Again, that's a theme that's come up today a lot. Um, and that's at both national and local level. Clearly, local government and indeed elective mayors, as we heard this morning from New York City, have a, have a role. And directors of public health locally, I know, are working really hard on the challenges presented by, uh, by this um, huge uh, challenge. Um, so that's the public sector. The private sector has a role, uh, as uh, mentioned by Yonet earlier. I think the private sector is really important. And the, some of the learning from Wellnor uh, also explores the roles of social entrepreneurs in community development. And then there's a third sector, there's a voluntary sector. And this is something that I've become quite interested in. Um, actually, just as an aside, can you put your hand up if you have been involved in any voluntary activity in the last five, six years or so? It can be working for a charity, it can be on your own, it can be as a club. Great, I can see most of you are. And that reflects the national, uh, thank you for that, that reflects the national um, uh, surveys as well. About seven in ten of us over a period of a few years will have been involved in in, uh, in a voluntary activity. It's a massive force for change. And um, I, I've been involved in voluntary work really from a very early stage uh, in my career. Um, I, I worked um, for uh, voluntary organizations in um, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan in the 1980s. I worked for Medicine Sans Frontier uh, for a short while. I worked with Bob Geldof and the Band-Aid uh, work for Ethiopia and Sudan again in the 1980s. And I owe my career to what I learned in those days, my understanding of population health and how important it is, not just treating individuals, but working at population level. I can see that um, I, my feeling is that I think Voluntary work has changed over the years. And I've been doing some work with VSO as their health advisor just recently. And I've been enormously privileged to be part of their uh, communities of practice, which engage something like 80 projects across 20 countries, across Africa and Asia. What I've realized is that the old model of VSO, where perhaps a British European and Westerner going out to an African or Asian country is way out of date. And VSO operate what they call a volunteer, volunteering for development model, which is where most volunteers are from those countries themselves, empowered to work in those countries. I've got some fantastic examples, but I probably haven't got enough time to tell you, but I've been working with a group of doctors in Myanmar recently, uh, and um, I'm in awe of uh, the fact that they use their work with BSO as their mainstream uh, work and are constantly under the threat of government uh, intervention or at worst being arrested through the work they're doing. It's really quite awe-inspiring. And I wanted to, this slide is um, uh, 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 an example of volunteering has changed and 300 organizations in this country have uh, also looked at where volunteering is going in the future. And I, I think this is really interesting because they basically say, look, we've had business as usual. We've had the ideas of these you know, volunteer community armies and so on. That needs to be disrupted. And I think COVID-19 has been part of that. And looking at a new emerging future where, it, where volunteering is much more decentralized people and community driven, and the role of data in supporting that. And um, this is a, a strategy that's been produced by 300 major charities in the UK. It was only published about a month ago. It's on that website. And they've really covered some of the, um, the areas of, of, uh, of, of, of change that are needed around, particularly power and equity and inclusion, which I I encourage you to have a look at that. So in my uh, closing uh, comments, um, I think volunteering is becoming more interesting and more relevant. Uh, it's certainly uh, 
there are evidence there that it can help in reducing inequalities and poverty. We have a major crisis around loneliness and mental health at the moment. And um, possible changing expectations and retreating of the state. Very interesting debate at the moment going on about the leadership of this country and the role and how much of the state will be left. And of course, the climate crisis, the recognition that we're all in this together and we have to start working together. So I've got three messages as I conclude this uh, very short memorial lecture. Um, the first is that uh, volunteering is changing and I think it's getting really exciting. The second is I think universities have a major role in this. Uh, you can volunteer to help with your local communities through about through work at the university, um, but also in there is very little research and evaluation on the impact uh, that this sort of strategy has. And I think universities have a major role there. And my final point is that I think in the north of England we need this more than ever, and very much in the spirit of uh, Aidan Halligan. Thanks very much. Right at the back, so I'm going to take the opportunity to embarrass her on every step down um, <laughs> as she comes down the stairs. So Professor Kay Marshall is our penultimate speaker, and um, you can read about all of her research and teaching excellence on her profile. But the reason why we've dragged her here today is because she's my boss and she's going to be leaving us for a well-earned retirement, but we are going to have her for in the Stockburg building, <laughs> so she's coming back closer uh, to be with us, but she's just been inspirational, amazing. All the things she's going to shoot me for, because yeah. uh, I've got my PMDR to the next <laughs> week. Um, but I just wanted to say, on behalf of the public health team, on behalf of our division, just a huge, huge thank you. And you've been the best of the best school, <laughs> as she's always saying. And we're just so, so glad that you're going to... I thought you were going to say, so glad I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> that you'll spend time doing what you want to do rather than spend time doing what we want you to do. <laughs> so without further ado, Kay. Thank, thank you, you our much. partner. I feel slightly embarrassed by our partner, but I'm not a person that's easily embarrassed. I'm a... My name is, I should say that first as a healthcare professional, Kay Marshall, and I'm a pharmacist by trade, and I'm a professor of reproductive endocrine pharmacology, so I often say I'm the professor of sex and drugs. So it does take a lot to embarrass me, so I'm, I'm not easily uh, made to be embarrassed. But I feel a bit embarrassed coming in and trying to help close the conference today, because after following a speaker like that, I cannot say I've worked in war zones, although it gets quite hot politically in the faculty <laughs> in the Central University at times. I have dodged a few bullets and probably fired a few in my time. And I only remember watching Band Aid. So I haven't got any great stories really to say of my endeavours. But I have had the pleasure of coming to this public health festival for the last six years and supporting it in its 10 years of its... Um, lifetime so far and I hope it goes on for many more tens of years because we've got a great team here and it's always a pleasure and I just wish I'd been able to be here rather than at faculty leadership teams and finance meetings and things like that I have looked at the program and hopefully we'll be able to see some of it online that we can watch later because that's what I intend to do 
Um, I thought the programme was so wide reaching. It was a fantastic array of different speeches and talks, great learning sessions. And like all great learning sessions, I hope they've all stimulated you to think, because that's always the key learning outcome that we want. And I hope you've had very, very lively discussions. I don't think when I looked at talks, particularly some this afternoon, I wouldn't exactly call them uplifting, but they're enlightening and we need to be enlightened and we need to talk and showcase some of the topics um, that you've been looking at today. Um, you know, how broad a church public health actually is to encompass some of the things that you've been looking at today, violence against women, that must contribute to ill health and it damages well-being of all of those people entangled in its locality. Um, so it is, you've done some great work so far. And I think one of the best things about COVID, it's, it's great to be back here in person, but it's allowed us to, to join and Zoom or whatever media you're using. Uh, to get more people in. I saw that there's a good array of um, virtual speakers. We've had delegates from all over the world because our Masters in Public Health here has got, I don't know, students from over 100 countries join us. We've got well over a 1,000 alumni from different parts of the world. That's how you spread good public health, I think, by training great healthcare professionals. And I think one of the best things that I've done is meeting a lot of the people that have been on our course, and it is multidisciplinary. Public health doesn't belong to one discipline, it belongs to all of us and we're all responsible for it. And I think it's been absolutely wonderful that we've encouraged this multidisciplinary approach. Um, and because we've had such growth in our Masters in Public Health programme, it means that I as head of school have had the great pleasure in increasing the numbers of staff that we have to help and support our partner. I think when we started off our partner, it was our partner. Um, and we, we've grown it now. I think we've got about 40 staff now working on our MPH and in public health in the Division of Population Health, Health Services, Research and Primary Care. Uh, I've got to the end of my tenure, I can say it. Um, and that investment for me as an academic leader well, it's a no brainer, really, because we've invested in some more staff who are really great value for money because they contribute to a fantastic program that evaluates well by our students. And I hope work in their home countries to help shape and change the world, because there's a lot of that, as you've heard today, that needs doing. But a byproduct of all that is that they do quite a lot of good research as well. We just had a huge uplift in the REF in UOA Unit of Assessment 2 that focuses on public health and epidemiology. So they've done well in terms of the research excellence framework, for which I'm very grateful. Gives me bragging rights. So I take a lot of the carious pride in what they've done, but it's brought in over 30 million pounds of grant income, which is phenomenal by anybody's standard. And I think that income is going in really to fantastic projects all over the world. It's not just here, although we still need it here. The people of the Northwest, you know, I want to live as long as somebody in the South of England, just because I happen to be a Northerner, doesn't mean to say I deserve 10 years less of life. So we've got all of those inequalities to wrestle with. We've still got them. There's so many inequalities. At graduation ceremonies last week, I was talking to all those graduates. And I think health inequality is one of the greatest challenges of our time that we have all got a responsibility for to try and make it better. Um, so we need all of our energy and expertise. So I'm absolutely thrilled that our MPH programme, our staff working and researching in public health have gone from strength to strength, certainly over the last six years, thanks to the leadership of our partner to encourage them. So it's been a real virtuous circle. You know, we hear often about the other sorts of circles, the vicious type. We've had a virtuous circle at Manchester and it just keeps getting better and better. So I hope that it continues and whoever stands here in the next 10 years time can say it's, it's even done more great things. So I hope you've had a fantastic day's conference. I hope you've learned a lot. Hope you've made some new connections. I know that's what I've missed a lot from uh, not being at face-to-face -face conferences. It's that conversation in the coffee queue that stimulates you to build a new relationship, make you think about a new research project. So go away. And as I say to the undergraduates, go away and change the world. So thank you, our partner for inviting me.
Oh, yes, of course. Um, so Kay's very kindly going to give the prizes out. And Paul, I hope you're getting ready for your... Who's, Paul's going to finish the um, uh, festival as we started. But starting off with our prizes. So um, the Young Investor Award, please can I ask Nina and Safina to come down? Are you here, both of you? Not one. Thank you. Then we have um, two runners up. We've got Jamila Wak sorry, Wakawa Zama for the runner up for the best poster presentation and Lisa Jennings. And Lisa Jennings, sorry. <laughs> make you sit in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and best poster prize goes to Charlie Fitzgerald. <laughs> Charlie graduated, I feel like doing so. <laughs> Charlie graduated well, this year. <laughs> And then we have our uh, runner-up certificate for the best oral presentation. So Kanupriya and David Gilbert. So Kanupriya, compliment. Oh, yes. Yes. And David Gilbert, are you here? Best oral presentation goes to Nikito Fossi. Brilliant. So, um, would the prize winners just stay down here because we're going to do a photo with uh, Professor Marshall? <laughs> so, uh, don't be going. But, Paul, are you, are you coming? And whilst you're coming down the stairs, but um, we have Baldy, who has been here from the beginning. From the beginning. From the beginning. He's not old enough. <laughs> oh, I'm really aged, I can tell you. <laughs> aged P. <laughs> so, Paul, please, I'll hand over to you. Just tell me how to turn the, uh, how to get onto the page. <laughs> Whilst we just sort out Paul's. Look at this. Oh, brilliant. Manchester yeah. University back up. <laughs> While we do that, that I'm always back there. Start to pretend no furry. Oh, 
Oh, don't worry. I, I've got a piece of paper here. Now we're talking. Oh, there. Um, right. Or you can use that. Bit. There's the right. Yeah, got it. Now I have a very loud voice, so I don't really need a microphone. Aiden Halligan, by the way, I was uh, like a partner. I've been coming here a long time, and he's one of the nicest people you could ever meet, not just a real clever man. And the best thing I could say about him was he was you. And everybody who ever met him, he was just human. He was, he, he, was, he was an exceptionally clever man. And yet, he could, he, he could just walk in anywhere with anybody from any place. And he was absolutely... He was Irish, that's quite a good start. My dad was Irish and he was called Brendan, so there we go. Uh, right, okay. Aiden, lovely. Uh, thank you, Kay, uh, you know, for all the lovely things you say about what goes on. Now, uh, uh, Paul, who actually did Aiden's thing, was talking about volunteers. And basically, uh, I'm a volunteer, and when the NHS... Uh, Last NHS chief exec, Simon Stevens, came in in 2014. We're really trying to uh, push patient groups and put patients at the centre and all this sort of stuff. And, and up until him leaving, that really continued. But I'm sad to say, in his, uh, both COVID and his leaving, things have gone awry. So uh, I would just say that this is about life inequality not just um, what we've already mentioned. So the urban dilemma, can we afford good health and protection for all? This is what this is about. Now, most people, they're not necessarily clued up on um, what patient groups actually have. Uh, Wigan Shaw is Or in terms of people. Uh, now we produce what goes through the ball ball in the Right, the primary role of a patient group, I think it's important that it actually is a
You need to rely on science. Changes that came straight into place as a result. Right. Do you still stand for straight to straight health and welfare? Its point of view is not to protect the food critical or can afford without protection. It's the only underlying people can look at healthy health of family and the friends, but not always the good survival. What it tells us is how we get the chest and which for the rich neighborhood. I started off with something. I said that it's life in Basically, that's based on charts. Seventy five is uh, the average one against the average base one of the this bit, the absolute area was too wide. Thank you. 
In England, we uh, started paying for our courses. We've done all these things. Scotland don't do it. They've got, you know, they've got great institutions like us. They don't do it. We have to think about these things. The politicians we listen to just think over the next two weeks, that's what they should be talking about. And uh, what did I say I was going to say? Apparently, I said I had a question for so and so, didn't I? Oh, there it goes. Right. Are we the counterintuitive ape? How's that one? That would have got him. And by the way, it's practical experience, the science training, science teaching. Because if you go out and you talk to anybody who's never left this country and they live, live in a really flat Lincolnshire, really flat part of the country, right? If you'd have asked them 200 years ago whether the earth was flat, they'd have said, of course it is. Are you crackers? They never moved four mile, four mile outside the village. It is correct to their mind to assume, given what they can see and their practical experience, that everything's flat. But we have science teaching. 
and it tells us we live on the globe. And you talk to anybody today, they say, anybody who said you weren't living on a globe is balmy. That's not what practical experience teaches us, and that's what counterintuitive behavior is about. So the term counterintuitive ape is just that. Anyway, on that note, thank you very much for staying around. Uh, it's just a great honor to be here. Thank you, Paul. So please stay down here because we've got photos. Oh, right. So don't go back up. But I need to call down two very important people. Are Carmel and Tracy here? Yes. Carmel and Tracy, come on down. <laughs> Any whilst Carmel and Tracy are coming down. Are you able to get the team in? Are they here? Oh. These girls gave me a bunch of bananas one year to go over. Do you remember? I do oh, look like an ape, I know it. It's just <laughs> so Carmel and Tracy have been the stalwarts of the festival from the beginning. You've probably seen them at the front of Stockford, knowing your name, knowing where to go and have just been amazing. I'm sure Kay and I will be uh, joint in our appreciation of all they do for us. And so just a little bit of our respect and thanks for all you do for us. Two photos. So um, uh, we got to thank the team. Um, Scott, is that you at the back? I can't see where Scott is. Scott's come over from Georgia State. Oh, okay, no probs. Um, but anyway, we've got Georgia State here doing a summer school, and we've got our fabulous speakers that have come from all over the place. So I wanted to say a huge thanks to them. Uh, my team who always disappear when it's time to thank them. Oh, here they come. Um, but I just want to say that the there's definitely no I in team. And without them, they um, this wouldn't have occurred. So huge thanks to everyone. And thanks to you all. Are you all starving for your burger? Um, <laughs> because there are lots of burgers. And so I just wanted to say huge thanks to you all for staying. It's been a marvellous day. And so would the special plenary speakers and the afternoon speakers and the prize winners just come down here for a photo op? And if any of the team are here, that would be phenomenal. But thank you so much. Otherwise, <laughs> the barbecue's downstairs on B floor. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do you remember I do, I do. Well, because they are. Yeah, yeah. Wait. You got me. Okay, you've got the same <laughs> Yeah, she's only half the woman she was. <laughs> <laughs>